My name is Zach Compton, and I am the Director of Education and Community Engagement with the Jazz Arts Group here in Columbus. And we are thrilled that you're joining us for Offstage Live. We're sharing this with you on our Facebook accounts at Jazz Arts Group and at the Jazz Academy. And uh, we thank you for being with us. This is episode four, and we are here with the Columbus Jazz Orchestra Rhythm Section. Before we get started, I would like to just make a few announcements. Um, during this crazy time that we are living in, uh, Jazz Arch Group is doing everything it can to continue to support students in the schools uh, via online lessons and working with teachers and developing curriculum materials. We are continuing to pursue our future concerts and keep the jazz live here in Columbus. As such, we ask that if you would be so willing uh, to support our cause, you can go to jazzemergencyfund.com in order to make a small contribution to our cause. The Jazz Emergency Fund is Jazz Arch Group's way of continuing to keep our doors open, to keep our music playing, to keep students learning, and to keep jazz alive in Columbus. So you can go to jazzemergencyfund.com in order to see that information. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the musicians in the rhythm section of the Columbus Jazz Orchestra. Gentlemen, you may unmute yourself and join us. Hello. Good evening. Hi there. Hi there. Hello. All right. So we have with us the great Bobby Floyd on piano and Chris Berg on the bass, Bob Brighthop on the drums, and the honorary guitarist tonight with the Columbus Jazz Orchestra, Mr. Derek Desenzo. Uh, it's so great to be here with you all. One of the things that I absolutely love about this is that I'm a rhythm section player. I've had the fortune of playing with, uh, playing alongside, learning from you, all of you. And so this is going to be real easy for me because I, I can talk for days about this stuff. Um, but Bob, I want to start with you. Um, you've been the drummer in the Columbus Jazz Orchestra for as long as anybody's been in the in the band and as far as the current personnel goes is that correct yeah that's right I, uh, I think the first uh the first concert that i played with the band was either at the end of 1978 or the first um part of 1979 and then i joined the band sort of on a permanent basis in 1980. And so talk about um, sort of the musical identity of the band at the time. You know, even the founder of the organization, Ray Eubanks, has mentioned that um, the band has taken many turns in terms of uh, its identity musically. What was the band like in those days and uh, how has it evolved to what it is today? Well, the, the band really started as, as, a, as a rehearsal band. I mean, just playing through charts. Now, th and th this is not 1978. This is in 1973 and 1974. But... Um, you guys would just get together and get charts together. They would bring things in, uh, and and things evolved rather quickly. But but yet, uh, the, still in 1978, the, there was a relatively small but very enthusiastic audience uh, that that in Battelle Hall, uh, over on King Avenue, one concert a week on Sunday evening. So we would get together. Um, Oh, I think I think we would have three rehearsals in those days. It would be maybe Friday, uh, a rehearsal on Saturday, and a rehearsal in the afternoon on Sunday, and then go on over and play the concert on Sunday night. And um, and so the the band at the time, um, you know, it it had a it had a lot of energy and a lot of really um, spectacular soloists. Um, uh, you know, Ola Hansen. Um, uh, Byron Rooker, who was playing tenor sax at the time, Bobby Pierce on piano. This is before Hank joined, um, and um, Wes was playing lead. And so the band had, uh, uh, you know, not only had a lot of energy, but it also functioned in other in other ways. There was a, a member of the band, Jerry Kay, who was uh, had been a band director, but was a contractor and also conductor for Red Skelton, who lived in town, and so the band functioned as in those days called the jazz arch group function as the jazz arch group in that setting but also functioned a great deal as um uh, a band that jerry would front pretty much with the same personnel uh playing shows uh we would play at the state fair uh, every year we play 17 days at the state fair 34 shows uh and then any and all other kinds of situations so it was a uh, so the band got its act together, if you will, uh, not only in terms of, of the stuff that we played as a band, 
but also in a very active role outside the uh, uh, the auspices, if you will, of the of the jazz arts group. So um, it's, it's sort of gained its identity. Uh, a lot of charts uh, arranged at that time by Vaughn Weister, uh, and uh, you know some original stuff. And uh, so it was a it was a very exciting time. And so uh, I'm, I want to change gears just a little bit because I've been dying to show this picture to our audience. The audience has come to know the sound of the drums with the Columbus Jazz Orchestra with you, Bob. Um, but they may not know uh, the humble beginnings of Bob Brighthop. Yeah, yeah. Um, so talk to us about this photo. What are we looking at here? Well, we're other looking... than a handsome swinging young drummer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, early used car salesman. Um, um, so uh, yeah, that was in, uh, when I was a senior in high school. Uh, and uh, I went to Marion Harding High School um, in uh, Marion, along with a, a, a very talented piano player by the name of Bobby Floyd. And um, uh, there may be a couple of other pictures that we want to show. But, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, it was, you know, in those days, um, it, it was interesting because if you lived in a moderately, uh, moderate sized town, uh, Marion was an example. Uh, Canton was an example. My pal Jim Rupp, same way. You know, we were able to play a lot of gigs, and um, and and there was a lot. Live music, of course, was a big deal in those days. And so I started playing. Uh, oh, that's nice. Um, yeah, beyond always, Bob. always a well-rounded percussionist, Bob. That's Never it. just a drummer. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, so we were playing a lot of gigs in those days. Um, uh, you know, and, and young, young guys playing gigs too. I was able to play, uh, you know, uh, with, with players twice my age, three times my age as a 15 and 16 year old guy. Wow. Now, now is this photo from the same era or is this now in college? No, no, this was from the, the, the same, the same time. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the other person on the right side is a fantastic, talented a uh, musician by the name of uh, Flip Miller, who um, lives uh, currently in Indianapolis. His dad was the band director. And uh, the guy on the, to my left was a guy by the name of uh, Dick Erickson, whose father was Bob Erickson, uh, died very uh, young, but he was kind of the guru of music in Marion. He owned the music store and uh, was a big, uh, big help to all of us. So yeah. Um, now you teed it up uh, that that yourself and Bobby Floyd grew up together, and um, I, you know, we have this wonderful example of that here, uh, and that's a perfect segue to you, Bobby. Yes. What's going? How many buttons are on that suit jacket? <laughs> you know, I, I I sort of remember that jacket, but it's been so long, and I can't really see the picture, but I know it's more. It's a double-breasted jacket, of course. Yep. Yep. Now uh, it says here in the caption, I'm, I'm guessing this is from a yearbook. Director Miller discusses new numbers with Bob Brighthop, Bob Floyd, and Bruce Burton of the Bob Floyd Trio. Tell us about the the early Bob Floyd Trio in Marion, Ohio. The Bob Floyd Trio started when we were all, I think, in the 10th grade, our first okay. year in school. Uh, and uh, we played, you know, for high school functions. We also played uh around Marion downtown. There was a club downtown in Marion called the Keg and Vine on Main, I think it was Main Street in Marion. And we had, believe it or not, 10th graders, a steady gig in a nightclub in Marion. We, I, can't, I can't remember, what did we work, like Friday, Saturdays, Bob? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, was, uh, it was pretty unbelievable. We, I mean, we realized that we were fortunate at the time, but as we look back, I don't think we really realized how fortunate we were to be able to, uh, you know, as 15 year old kids uh, with their parents bringing them to the gig because we, we weren't old enough to drive yet. Right. So, you know, we, we, we saw some, you know, it was great. We, we played some great music. We saw some weird stuff. Our first bar fights, you know, <laughs> the place across the street called the Portofino lounge uh, that we played sometimes. And, um, you know, Bobby's dad was very supportive of him playing in the club. His mom, not quite so much, but. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh <-huh. laughs> but so, so that's a great question. So Bobby, um, you know, the Bob Floyd trio, 
Um, talk about your early influences. I know you came up in the church. Um, the sound of gospel music and the blues is so imbued inside of your your sound. Talk just a little bit about your beginnings and and in as at a young age starting to lead a band. Um, talk about how jazz kind of entered your life. Well, yeah, it, it started like way before we started the band. My my father was a jazz lover, and he loved uh, listening to piano jazz. One of his favorite pianists was Earl Garner, mm. uh, which he, he eventually became my favorite also because we listened to him all the time. And I love the way he played. So that was part of, that came from my dad. My mom was also a church pianist, you know, and I actually uh, started playing in church at a very young age. I kind of took her place. Uh, so that's where the gospel part. So I, you know, listening to jazz I, as I was growing up, you know, to learn how to play uh, both jazz and gospel, I listened to both. I, so, you know, I listened to everybody from uh, James Cleveland to Earth, Wind and Fire to Thelonious Monk, uh, in, you know, in jazz and gospel. Right. So that's where a lot of my, uh, a lot of my influence comes from, just listening to a variety uh, uh, a variety of musicians. Yeah, yeah. I want to hear more about that, and I want to get Chris and Derek into it. But first, let's take a hiatus, baby. Uh, Bobby, will you play just a short tune for us? Sure. And then, and before you do that, I want you to tell everybody where you're at and uh, and what's going on tonight. Oh, hey, I'm right now. This is commercial. Right now, I'm at the mansion downtown, five thirty East Town Street, and I am wiping down the piano, getting ready to play. Uh, a live stream tonight. I think we start at 7.30 and we'll probably play about, you know, somewhere between a half hour and 45 minutes. And it's going to be the trio, the trio uh, that I have with uh, Reggie Jackson on drums and Derek DeCenso on bass. Usually when we play here, we do organ trio, but we're doing something a little different tonight. And that's the reason we're playing on Thursday night is because we want to do something different and have piano trio. So it, we'll be back to Oregon Trail. We, we, we do broadcast on Sunday nights also. And my understanding, Bobby, is that even the musicians will be maintaining uh, a minimum of six feet distance and uh, there will be no audience in person for this show. It'll be live streamed. Is that right? Yeah, uh -huh. it'll be live streamed uh, on, is it on Facebook? Should be on the Blue Velvet Room Facebook page, I believe. And you can also go to bluevelvetroom.com. Right. Oh, Double, right? Yeah. Right. Uh huh. Well, well yes, people, we are keeping our distance. I, I, they try to stay away from me, anyway, as it is. <laughs> so yeah. We are more apart. Yeah. Well, everyone can can transition right over to that when we're done here. But what, if you don't mind, Bobby, play us a, sm a short one. Okay. I have no idea what to play. What do you want to hear? Any requests? How about some of that Earl Gardner stuff? Okay. Very good, Bobby. You sound excellent as as always, um, and and that's a great transition to the to the rhythm section of the Columbus Jazz Orchestra. And I want to share a photo here. I think this this really captures uh, as far as Bob at the drums, Bobby at the piano, and Chris at the bass. Just the hookup that the three of you have. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, I've had the privilege of playing from uh, or learning from all three of you. And um, uh, each of your approach to the big band 
is not unlike your approach to the small group is is there it's listening it's sensitive it's intimate not always just cranking along to support a, a 17 piece orchestra and with that i want to ask you chris um tell us about um your first interactions with the columbus jazz orchestra either as a spectator or uh of course when you started playing with the with the band i think the first time i went to hear him at the southern theater was somewhere around 2000 brad good invited me and uh, Clark Terry was the guest. Ah. And uh, when he sang Mumbles, which is uh, Mumbles, when he sang Mumbles, he, uh, he does a shtick at the end of Mumbles where he uh, does a kind of a, uh, uh, an extended um, cadenza of mumbling. And, in, and that night he did something like, Brad Good, Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that tells you the time frame. And then uh, about two years later, I started getting called to, uh, to play with the orchestra. And that was around 2002. Ray Eubanks was still conducting. Mm. And then somewhere around 2004, 2005, I became the full-time steady basis. Well, before I, uh, I hear about your, your early days in New York, I want to share just a short little bit of audio um, from one of the tracks off of the Colors of Jazz album. So this is I Found a New Baby. And one of the things that I love about it is you can immediately hear the hookup of the rhythm section right at the top of this one. And so one of the things I love about that is that right at the top, it's it's rhythm section, it's tight, and it's supporting supporting the the duo there. And then the big band comes in, and and the energy is there, but it never loses that sensitivity uh, as a hookup, as a rhythm section. Uh, Chris, talk a little bit about playing in the Columbus Jazz Orchestra and just the the what you're thinking about in terms of the lock with that rhythm section in the band, uh, and what it means to play with guys like Bob and Bobby, and of course Derek when Derek gets the chance to join us. Well, I always like it when, when Derek is playing because he and I are both doing the same thing, which is quarter notes, and it really swings. Um, but I, I must say, playing with the two Bobs, uh, it's, it's so effortless. I mean, we just feel the time the same way. I think it's because we're from the same generation. We listen to the same records. It just, it, it's just uh, kind of a no-brainer to right, hook up right. with those guys. And and Bob and Bobby uh, uh, would I'm I'm guessing you would agree with those sentiments. Oh yes, definitely. Like Chris said, you know we're all from the same. We're all about the same. We all kind of grew up listening to the, uh, you know, the same musicians, the style of jazz. And uh, hey, we we love this. Yeah. You know, uh, if I could add one thing, just a little bit about 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 Chris. You know, when Chris moved moved into the area he didn't move in I mean he certainly moved in as an accomplished musician but that wasn't why he came uh, necessarily into uh, <clears throat> central Ohio uh, but prior to uh, and, I, and I, I think I think I hope uh, I'm right that I that I found it Ray about Chris early on because he and I uh, along with Brad Good uh, were playing with Ernie Krivda's small group uh, and traveling around the Midwest at the time, uh, Joe Hunter was playing piano and, and uh, others, but we would, we were doing a lot of playing, uh, around the area. And, um, and it was, it was just so great to have somebody like, you know, like Chris, like there just playing, you know, acoustic bass right in the middle of the beat, um, right. you know, uh, not way on top and messing around, but right there. And, um, uh, you know, that, that's, that's my favorite kind of feel. 
Uh, you know, right square in the beat. John Clayton plays that way. Uh, Derek plays that way on bass. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a, such a great, uh, you know, such a great a way to, uh, to, to play. Cause you know, you as a, and especially when there's guitar, as Chris said, you know, that's wonderful too. But I yeah. just had to kind of point that out. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And so, Chris, uh, you know, your early musical experience was in New York and uh, you turned me on to this documentary that you're a part of in 1980 about a pianist named Joe Albany. Uh, tell everybody who Joe Albany was and then we'll show this little clip of you playing in this in this trio. He was kind of a legend. Um, he played with Charlie Parker in the mid 40s and he was really one of the bright lights of uh, bebop pianos along with uh, maybe Al Haig, and sort of a Charlie Parker's third favorite piano player after Bud Powell and Al Haig. And then he kind of fell into um, decline with uh, heroin and other bad habits. And he ended up leaving New York, trying to get himself all cleaned up and he went to Europe. And he made a big comeback in New York, right around the time I was playing in the village in all the jazz clubs as a young musician the late 70s and he heard me play at the West End Cafe and he hired me to play in his trio and uh, he was making a big comeback and all the press was there John Wilson from the New York Times would come to the gigs and he very often hired drummers like Jimmy Cobb I remember playing with Jimmy Cobb with him a bunch wow and it was a great bebop trio hard driving bebop trio and Somebody decided to uh, make a documentary film, which ended up being an award-winning film, a Canadian film, called uh, Joe Albany, A Jazz Life. And um, they used a lot of the live footage of that trio playing in the film. Yeah, and I want to show everyone just a little clip of that that features uh, you, Chris, playing a bass solo, uh, including a little bit of bow here, which is, which is quite a nice little uh, touch. So let's get a little bit of that. Oh, let's get the audio going here. Try that again. It sounded so good, no one could hear it. <laughs> All right, let's try that again. Here we go. It was just like you just... happy at times and particularly I remember at school it was just like you just lived to day to day there were some activities or little triumphs that you get you know you could throw the baseball further and shit like that and there were the chicks that you had to crush and so on and cheerleaders and I kind of was like a, a guy a trans viewer you know watching and so clearly as you mentioned Joe Albany was quite the character but man that facial hair was on point <laughs> just the small little goatee and the mustache um, if I didn't have any facial hair I would have looked like I was underage to be <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, obviously that was a formative time for you and I remember hearing a concert with you uh, and the late great Mark Flugie where you told a story uh, about running into Ray Brown af I believe after a gig one night and he gave you some advice uh, recall that story for us <laughs> I had just played a, a club date um, which is what we call a, a wedding in New York. And um, I was going to the big uh, municipal parking garage with my bass and amp and my tuxedo, and it was pretty late at night. And I was thinking, gee, you know, I am so tired of playing weddings. I just want to play jazz. And, and I was really feeling down, and I was almost at the verge of thinking, I'm just going to quit. This was at a, a, a lull in my career. And so I got on the elevator, and just as I'm having that thought, another guy gets on the elevator with me, and it's Ray Brown. <laughs> and and I this is what I said. I still remember what I said. I don't know where this came from. I feel like I'm a little league pitcher and Sandy Koufax just got on the elevator with me. And for those of you who are young, Sandy Koufax was a great pitcher back in the 60s. So anyway, um, for the Dodgers. So Ray Brown kind of chuckles and he goes, so you had a gig, huh? And I said, yeah, I... I don't know, Ray. I don't know if I want to keep playing these stupid gigs. He goes, come on. You're a musician. Stick with it. 
something like that. It was very yeah. interesting. I can't remember exactly how it was. Right. And then we both get off the elevator. Now this is the an entire city block in New York, this municipal parking garage. And uh, it's like 10 stories, right? And we both walked to our cars, which were parked right next to each other. <laughs> his, his was, of course, a rental. But, you know, yeah. So the right. odds of that happening, even weirder than getting on the elevator with me. So. Well, and how serendipitous was that moment? For, even if even if his words of wisdom were, were, were succinct like that, just being in his presence at that moment, you know, that was that's oh, yeah, incredible. Oh, yeah, he was like, really warm and encouraging. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, wow. Um, okay, Derek. Hey. Chris talked about uh, the, remembering the late, great Clark Terry. What's going on in this picture, man? Uh, I am pretending to be cool and Clark Terry's friend. Yeah, you oh. seem like you're fitting in like like you're one of the Rat Pack, you know, hanging out with, uh, with Clark Terry here, snapping your fingers. Uh, so when was this? Uh, you know, Bob knows for sure. This was uh, backstage at, at uh, the Rife Center. No, at the, uh, that was at uh, uh, over on King and Avenue at the at Battelle uh, in the back. Oh yeah, Battelle right. Hall. That's even what I meant. Yeah, that was yeah. early days. So this would have been probably 95? about 94, 95, maybe something like that. Yeah. And so, Derek, had you played with the with then the the jazz arch group now the Columbus Jazz Orchestra? Were you on this show here? Yes, that is how I gained access to Clark Perry, <laughs> and um, uh, I had uh, started playing. Some shows with the, um, it was called the Jazz Arts Group, not the Columbus Jazz Orchestra yet. And um, Ray Eubanks had, had brought me in to play um, on a Nat King Cole tribute show featuring uh, Monty Alexander. And Monty was coming to town and he wanted to do some of the King Cole trio stuff. There we are. Uh, and um, that's Monty Alexander and me backstage at the Blue Note. Um, I believe Clark Terry was on that gig too. Wow. Um, but anyway, um, Monty came to Columbus. Uh, Ray Eubanks was a big fan and he wanted to do some trio format and he didn't want to use the electric bass because Al Berry played electric bass in the jazz arts group. He said, can I bring a bass player? And Ray said, sure, but I think I have a guitar player for you. And Ray hired me and um, it went really well. Wow. That. That's great. And so and so that would have been your first time playing yeah. with the with the orchestra at that time. The first time ever. And, uh, and then after that, I started doing a, a lot more shows and have some fond memories of playing in this rhythm section, you know, with um, with Bob here and Hank Marr. And um, sometimes it was Harold Jones on drums doing bassy music. And and I got to uh, be Freddie Green, the guitar player of the bassy show, uh, bassy band. Um, so yeah, that's when I started uh, playing with the Columbus Jazz Orchestra. And he and I can tell you that that when Derek that first show uh, there there was a, uh, actually Monty came in twice. He came in with Lynn Seaton once on bass, and then the first time with a bass player by the name of Marshall Wood. That's right. And uh, and it was really um, it was a great thrill. But um, in general, but uh, but Derek made uh, made it really happen. It was really wonderful. Yeah. And speaking of you, Derek, uh, we have a comment from our beloved Rosemarie Litzinger, uh, who, if any of you out there don't know Rosemarie, she's one of the biggest fans of jazz in Columbus and the Columbus Jazz Orchestra. She says uh, she loves hearing all these stories and the beard's looking good on you, Derek. Yeah, I, I said earlier, I'm officially older than Chris Berg now. <laughs> now changed. And while we're talking about your appearance, Derek, you know, you're kind of a Renaissance man. Uh, you know, I've played gigs with you where you've played bass, guitar. Uh, you do a Christmas show every year at Dick's Den where you sit down at the piano and crank out some of the Nutcracker Suite. Yes. Um, and this photo perhaps uh, uh, illustrates some of that the best. Oh what are we looking at here, Derek? Oh, well, uh, that's, that's Louis Chamoose on the right. Uh -huh. His name was uh, Johnny Cha Cha. The guy in the middle <laughs> is Tony Bonanza. And the bass player's <laughs> name was Vinny Gusto. It was and a, what was this group? It was an excuse for me to not only play piano, but sing and play piano, which I did. And uh, it was loungy and a lot of fun. 
All right. And and you're you're a man of few words on that engagement. We'll leave it at that, huh? <laughs> well, we had some good shows. Believe it or not, uh, Jeanette Williams uh, was our guest several times. Yeah, yeah. And of course, we love Jeanette dearly. And I can, I can only imagine what what Jeanette would have said when she saw you with that uh, <laughs> that open collar and the long chain and and the sunglasses. So that's she loved it. And since you've totally brought this out in the open, I'll just add that we sang Ebony and Ivory. <laughs> as as one would of course yeah very yeah. good well derek you mentioned uh somebody and, and i have two more things because i know that you guys are, are going to start playing uh i think we have to come back and do part two of the rhythm section here because uh, there are just so many more stories i think yet to be told um but you mentioned hank marr and i know all four of you gentlemen uh encountered hank heard his music studied with him uh uh, sort of shared uh, some of his larger than life spirit. I did not have the chance to meet him because he had passed right before I came to Columbus for college. Uh, but starting with you, Derek, talk about how important Hank Marr was uh, to yourself and Columbus. Oh, um, well, let me just tell you from, from my standpoint, um, because my dad, Richie DeCenzo, was a, a sax player who knew all these guys in, in the jazz arts group. Um, I got to see Hank Marr I got to go to a party one time, Gene D'Angelo's house and watch the jazz arts group play by the pool. And Hank Marr was just uh, so charismatic and, 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 and fun and, and great, of course, at jazz and piano. And uh, it was thrilling. And, and I think of that a lot when I think about how important it is for us to play in front of kids, because maybe they remember that day that they saw a jazz band and thought it was the coolest thing ever which happened to me. But uh, then I ended up playing with Hank and I learned quite a bit from him. Um, uh, also because of um, my involvement at Ohio State as a student and as an instructor. And, um, but Hank is a huge legend and, and um, Hammond organ legend and a great arranger and played the hippest left-hand voicings. And um, so, you know, huge influence on me. Yeah, yeah. Bobby, um, many that know, uh, that knew Hank, and then, of course, uh, fallen in love with your playing, uh, would consider you right in the lineage of not only great B3 organ playing, but piano playing. Um, talk a little bit about what Hank meant to you and how you continue to, to carry the legacy of certainly the B3, but of Hank in general. Oh, well, Hank, um, you know, uh, like you guys are saying, he was a great musician. I, you know, I always thought Hank was like really underrated uh, and didn't get quite the accolades and the attention that he deserved on a national basis. But he was right up there with, uh, you know, the Jimmy Smiths and the Joey D's. Uh, so yeah, he was a great musician. I learned so much. I, you know, I, I would go out to hear Hank play back in the day when he was playing the anchor in and, uh, um, the Taj Mahal and different clubs. This is back in the 70s and 80s. And I just moved here, you know, from Marion, Ohio. Uh, so I learned a lot from him. And, and not only was he a great musician, but he was a great person. Uh, very big heart, very nice person down to earth. Uh, Hank had every every right to be big headed and conceited just based on the, just based on the way he played because he was a great musician, but he wasn't that way. Uh. Uh, He's, yeah, he was a lot, a lot of fun, great to, to hear and, and great to hang out with. Yeah. Um, Chris, did you have a chance to get to know Hank? Did you get to play with him? I didn't really get to know him. I got to play with him because he was still playing with the Columbus Jazz Orchestra when I first started playing with him. So about half the time Bobby was playing and the other half Hank was playing. So I, I probably played two or three concerts with Hank and, and then he completely retired after that. And I also played a benefit concert for the jazz arts group. Bob Breithaupt played and, and Hank played piano the whole time. And it's the one time I got to play with him in a kind of a small group setting at this. Right. Uh, and and Bob, I know that, that not only being the drummer in the CJO, but your years as the executive director uh, coincided with a time uh, when Hank passed. And obviously you were a major part of continuing his legacy. Just talk for a minute about what Hank meant to you. Well, I mean, Hank, Hank was uh, a mentor and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, you know, sort of a guiding light in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, not only playing in the band, but also, you know, 
played a fair amount of, together in a small group. I mean, you know, Hank used to used to carry his own organ in the back of his, uh, in, in, you know, in a trailer, and he would make sure that there were only a few people that would help him. Derek probably remembers this. Only a few people that he would allow to help him load his trailer with the organ. And I felt like I was, had had you know uh, crossed over the uh, the the tracks when when he w deemed me uh, able to help load his trailer with. Uh, <laughs> he was meticulous about that. But a couple of things about Hank that I think is important for people to understand that that you know, not only was he a great performer, but he was a he was a groundbreaking educator, and he was um, he was very very adept. He's a really good arranger. And a great conductor, you know, he was um, he was one of the very few African American conductors uh, because he was George Kirby's conductor, the comedian. You know, there was there was Hank Marr and George Rhodes, who was a Sammy Davis Jr.'s conductor. I, fortunately, I was able to work with him too, but certainly a lot with Hank. But the most important thing is the the um, uh, the, the respect that a lot of people had for Hank, and unfortunately, you, you know, he would share some stories about less than respectful uh, individuals and musicians along the way, uh, as you can imagine, uh, when he was a conductor with uh, with George Kirby, you know, going into Vegas, and here's the charts, and okay, who's the conductor? Well, really, who's the conductor? No, it's this guy. And, and so... Um, you know, I I uh, don't have any direct knowledge about this, but you know, Bobby, you, you may know, or Derek, I, I, you know, other than George Rhodes and Hank Marr, were there any other no? And I suppose Quincy Jones, of course, but were, how many other notable African American conductors were there uh, in the in the '60s and the early '70s? I don't really know. The no, conductor I... for the New Jersey uh, Philharmonic, yeah, the New Jersey Orchestra. I can't remember yeah. what. It was. I went to hear them several times. He was African American. His last name was Lewis. Uh huh. Yeah. So I mean, that this... in the late sixties. So this is a small, small group of people, and you know, fortunately, it, it, it aligned when Bobby Pierce left town. Uh, you know, Hank had only been back in town on a full-time basis for a short time. And, and so right about 1982, uh, you know, Hank uh, joined the, the band. There's a picture that was taken on the stage of Mays Hall um, back, back about 1982, where the, the picture of the band and both Bobby Pierce and Hank are in that picture. Uh, and uh, so that was, uh, you know, we were very... I mean, if you really think about it, you know, the three, the three piano players we've had in the Columbus Jazz Orchestra, Bobby Pierce, Hank Marr, and Bobby Floyd. Are you kidding? Ooh. I mean, that, that, that's, uh, that's some heavyweight stuff there. Well, and Bobby talk about Hank uh, as an educator. And of course, we've had the Hank Marr High School Jazz Award going on for, I think, 17 years now. Uh, you guys will be pleased to know that this year, uh, given the fact that so many students are at home and unable to play, uh, with one another, we've started the uh, an extension of the Hank Marr Award called the Greasy Spoon Blues Showcase, oh, where students can go on and play a chorus of blues melody, take a solo and submit it. Uh, and we partnered with another person that simply adores uh, adored Hank, which is Jamie Abersalt, the great Jamie Abersalt. He donated uh, uh, five gift cards to uh, his company, jazzbooks.com, for any students that submit uh, we're going to award a bunch of students that submit a blues kind of in Hank's name. That's great. That's great. So um, the, kind of the lightning round here, because I know you guys are getting ready to play. Uh, I want to leave the audience with one recording from each of you. It doesn't have to be the, the seminal one, but when you think about rhythm sections and when you think about a rhythm section sound that is, has influenced you, that you always go back to uh, for at least one fundamental part of your playing whether it's big band or whether it's small group, uh, you think of this rhythm section and this sound from a record. Um, what one record would you recommend for, for the rhythm section sound on that record? Oh. Derek, why don't you go first? Oh. Um, well, 
I'll, I'll tell you one I like a lot, and it's well, it could be the Gene Harris group, but I like you know Monty Alexander with Jeff Hamilton and um, you know John Clayton. John Clayton. I mean, that's a that's a good band. Um, I should be you know talking about something with guitar like Basie. Certainly, Count Basie. Yeah. Any of the records. So, so are you talking about that live Montro record with them? Yeah, Is that's that... a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 Great. What about you, Chris? Well, um, I, I love the Knackhole Trio. Of course, there's no drums, but there sort of is because they're all hearing the same drummer, and you can kind of hear it too. It's a phantom drummer. But that was guitar, bass, and, and piano. Is there a particular trio. recording that sticks out for you on that? The recording of Body and Soul is the most amazing uh, progressive thing. It was done in 1941. And it sounds like it could have been recorded yesterday. Wow. Bob, what about you? Uh, I think. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Bobby. No, go ahead, Bob. Uh, for me, it's um, it, it's uh, it's probably uh, a record that Chick Corea did in 1968 called "Now He Sings, Now He Sobs." Um, yeah. So that that I mean, there's a lot of them. You know, it's like okay, you you go to this bag or this bag or this bag, but. You know, when whenever I get a chance to put that back on, um, uh, there, there, you, there you go. You know, Roy. And of Haynes, course, Haynes, yeah. You know. I was going to say Roy Haynes, and 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 probably one of the earliest recordings uh, with with a flat ride cymbal with no bell. Correct. Wouldn't yep. you say? The, the the first. Yeah, yeah. So now he sings, now he sobs by Chick Corea, uh, which is a wonderful example, a wonderful uh, record. Bobby, what about yourself? Uh, I'll have to say. Um... Earl Garner, the rhythm section that he used, and I, you know, I, I'm kind of just, I'm, I'm in. I love Earl Garner. He was my favorite pianist, and I just love the way, the, the, the whole band, the trio, sounded. Um, backing him up, they, you know, they really, they, they could really swing, but they did it in a different way because of the way he played piano with the, the, the striding left hand, the Freddie Green. On, on the piano right. and the, with the, the drums and the, the bass uh, accompanied him when he played that one. Is there a Errol Garner record in particular that was uh, particularly important for you? Oh man, there were, some, there, there were lots of them. I'm, I'm trying to think of the one. There's one where he did the song Caravan. I can't remember the name. Is that on Concert by the Sea? I was going to say Concert no, by the Sea. No, it's not Concert by the Sea. Uh, it's a, it's an album that's really kind of hard to find. I'd had a hard time finding it. Yeah. It's, well, it's we'll not... have to dig it up and, and share it with our audience because our, right. our audience loves to know what you all uh, are influenced by there. So um, I want to come back and do another episode with you guys because it's not it's been it's been uh, a lot of fun and and time flew by here. Um, Bobby, tell everybody one more time uh, how they can see the trio here coming up in just a minute. Okay, we start at seven thirty. Uh, and you can go to bluevelvetroom.com or go on Facebook and and see the trio. We'll, pro we'll probably play for about a half hour to 45 minutes. Yep. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to get to talk with you. Um, I know that, that our audience is missing you um, uh, dearly and cannot wait to hear you play in person and feel the, the energy of all the four of you in the rhythm section uh, and Thank you so much. And we will be talking to you all very, very soon. Thanks, Zach. Yeah. Thank you. Zach. And I'll just, and I'll just remind the audience that um, you can go to jazzemergencyfund.com uh, in order to support Jazz Arch Group during this time. Uh, your contributions will go uh, directly toward helping us support musicians, support artists, keep our organization going. Again, that's jazzemergencyfund.com. Uh, and of course, continue to follow us at the Jazz Academy and at Jazz Arch Group on Facebook. Uh, a huge thanks to all the people involved. Alexa Brennan, uh, Byron Stripling will be coming back this Sunday with our next episode, and we can't wait to see you then. Thank you so much.